opiates hair, satellite markets, and goth ice cream. Plus this day in history with Madeline McCann and our song of the day by the drums on your morning monarchy for May 3rd, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are for another hour-long blast of listener-supported media. We've been online since 9-11-05, and we are brought to you by you. A huge thanks to all our patrons, supporters, donors, subscribers. They keep us going and growing. MediaMonarchy.com slash support is the place to go. You can find the Bitcoin, the snail mail, the PayPal, the Patreon, and a huge thanks to our latest patrons at Patreon.com slash MediaMonarchy, like Janice Arcanis. Not real name. Huge thanks. And also to Brent B. for the bump up. It is very easy on Patreon to raise or lower your pledge by the month. It was never easy to do any of that kind of stuff on PayPal. It's very easy to do on Patreon. And I've even had some folks internationally... So I've heard some complaints about, of course, everything's going to take a cut. Everybody's going to take a cut. Patreon essentially takes 5%. But if you're foreign and you're doing that monthly, it can start to add up. So I had somebody who's in Australia who actually basically turned their Patreon, did a one-year amount of $60. And it'll go through once, and then they're going to lower it. Any number of ways you can kind of keep adjusting it. Hey, the big boys adjust their money. Can't we adjust our zeros and ones as well? So a huge thanks again to Janice Arcanis and to Brent B, our latest patrons on Patreon. And thanks to our buddy Alex, a.k.a. Shrooms Are Fun in the chat. He gave us a little bit of Bitcoin donation. Bitcoin, PayPal, Patreon. We have a post office box. You can just send us cash and checks. And some folks even do that. Any little bit helps. And as I say, if you can give a little, I can give a lot. And I think I do. That's 10 plus hours of live broadcast a week. You get an hour-long morning monarchy in the morning, news, talk, an hour-long daily DJ set at noon called Pump Up the Volume. Huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app for carrying the podcast of your morning monarchy and RadioConfluence.com for not only rebroadcasting your morning monarchy, your Pump Up the Volume, your good news next week, your new world next week, but they also simulcast us. Huge thanks to Jared and the growing community at RadioConfluence.com. There are amazing new shows on there getting way huger guests than I ever get. (laughs) <laughs> so c- huge congrats to to Rachel and Rob and Natty Jeff and all those folks for for building their shows. That's what it's all about. I'm stoked for all that. I'm stoked. James Comey is mildly nauseous. That's the quote everybody is running with. And of course, that's a pretty good quote as he's doing his little congressional testimony this morning. Each morning of your morning monarchy, we focus in on a different area of the news. Monday's World News, Tuesday's Tech, and Wednesday right here is your Food World Order Day. I coined that phrase on air many years ago. It just kind of came out of my mouth. I was like, oh, I love that. Food World Order. That's food, health, and environment news. And you can submit news stories using hashtag Food World Order. That's essentially how we organize everything. We put it all up on the tweets using hashtag Food World Order, and we publish the stories we're going to talk about about an hour in advance on what they call a Twitter moment. You don't even have to sign up for Twitter to look at any of it. You can click all the links and see all the stuff. So we put our headlines together ahead of time. So if you're at your desk or if you're in the position to follow along, you can see exactly where we're going to go. And of course, after the show, everything is in the show notes. Everything we say and play in the show notes. Of course, tomorrow's Thursday's episodes are strange and weird and dark. And definitely not safe for work. And Friday, we look at the entertainment industrial complex. We'll also be taping that latest episode of New World next week, coming up a little bit later today. Episode 309, something like that? I'll have to double check. I'm in charge of keeping count of the numbers. (laughs) Let's glance at the breaking lamestream news before we dive into your delicious, nutritious food world order menu, Windows 10S, everything you need to know about the latest computer you're not interested in. Human rights... Human rights watch slams Hamas, cruel and indefensible, Ivanka Trump quotes Jane Goodall, North Korea uses human shields, Nancy Pelosi uses Democrat shields to keep them all united behind Obamacare, and yes, James Comey says he's mildly nauseous at suggestions he swayed the election. Oh, America's next top president. Still exciting people, still getting massive clicks, and honestly, a massive economic generator in the States. And we can wonder and speculate and laugh about all those batches of winners arrested over on May Day here in peak Portland. Do you think they stole those Pepsis they were throwing? Do you think they used their Oregon welfare benefits to get them? 
Do you think they stole them from the commissary where mommy and daddy are paying for their school? Any number of questions we can wonder about peak Portland. But let's dive into our Food World Order news. Again, my friends, it is Wednesday, May 3rd, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more from MediaMonarchy.com. Let's just set the stage and ask the question, what does the CIA have to do with a black bear that died of cocaine overdose? You know you're listening to Media Monarchy now. Andrew Carter Thornton II, Act 2, is a name unknown to most except as a piece of historical trivia. The man who fell from the sky in 1985 with millions of dollars of cocaine strapped to his body. To a few others, he's one of the men tied to a drug operation that was fueling and fueled by government corruption, whose roots were traced as far as the Kentucky governor's mansion. But reality, revealed through his FBI file, is even stranger tracing the corruption surrounding Act 2, Andrew Carter Thornton II, back to the CIA. On the morning of 9-11-1985, Act 2's body was found with dried blood running from his mouth, wearing khaki-colored clothes, black gloves, and a point-blank type bulletproof vest by body armor. Act 2 had with him a Browning 9mm automatic pistol, a 22 caliber Derringer, night goggles, books with names and codes, thousands of dollars in cash, and six Krugerrands. The most immediately significant piece of evidence at the scene were the 35 one kilogram packages of cocaine. Now, we're grabbing this story from the always interesting FOIA digging muckrock.com, and you can always look at all of their documents. They have them all published, and there's even this little handy dandy magnifying glass tool that when you hover over it with your mouse, you can read the documents that much better because, of course, they are photocopied in black and white. An examination of the body revealed that he had died six to eight hours earlier in the same place where his body was discovered. The police were soon notified by the Macon County Sheriff's Office that a crashed Cessna 404 had been found nearby with no signs of any fatalities or survivors. Police connected the plane to Act 2 and his death was ruled an accident. Later, Georgia Bureau of Investigations would use the flight path of Act 2's drug smuggling plane to solve the mystery of a black bear's apparent death by cocaine overdose. We go to the New York Times, December 23, 1985, Cocaine and a Dead Bear, Dateline, Blue Ridge, Georgia. A 175-pound black bear apparently died of an overdose of cocaine after discovering a batch of the drug, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation said. The cocaine was apparently dropped from a plane piloted by Andrew Thornton, a convicted drug smuggler who died September 11th in Knoxville, Tennessee, because he was carrying too heavy a load while parachuting. The Bureau said the bear was found Friday in northern Georgia among 40 opened plastic containers with traces of cocaine. That dead bear essentially leads us on and on and on. And it leads us to what's called the Bluegrass Conspiracy. There's a book written by Sally Denton. Documents rumors of more meaningful connections, such as rumors that Act 2's drug operations were helping support the United States' covert operations in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and South Africa. Ralph Ross, the Lexington officer investigating the case, became convinced that Act 2 was involved in Oliver North's Iran-Contra network, which provided support to him through both CIA and DEA resources. This goes up to Thomas Kleins, Theodore Shackley, General Secord, notorious CIA operatives. A fascinating story. The strange death and even stranger life of cocaine cowboy Andrew Carter Thornton II. Drug traffickers' FBI file cast doubt on CIA's denials of supporting Iran-Contra-related drug trafficking. I think that's a really interesting way to start our Food World Order episode, and I think it shows in a lot of ways what animals can do for us and what we do to them. One poor coke-addled bear helps expose criminals in action, the Cocaine Importation Agency. So let's take that and go to our first of at least two articles on this episode from our friend Claire Burnish. You can find her on the tweets at subversive underscore pen. We've interviewed her before, and we love to highlight her articles as we love to highlight independent alternative work, especially when it has kind of a positive bit like Claire Burnish's work does. Safety of the people and security of the nation should be priority number one for any leader who wishes to have a successful tenure in office, perhaps even multiple terms. 
And America's next top president is no exception to this model. So why then has a killer of tens of thousands each year still on the loose inside those beautifully impermeable borders? How could this executioner, unmasked and identified, roam main streets of small towns as comfortably as a seedy alley in some decrepit corner of an urban metroplex, unhindered by the threat of detention or arrest? How could this nefarious reaper sever the lives of 91 Americans each and every day? Yet, rather than earn a notorious status as public enemy number one, this killer is encouraged to thrive, intentionally or not, by those supposedly the most trusted to guard us against bodily harm. Since 9-11, the United States has waged the pernicious war on terror, combating a concept most of its citizenry will never encounter firsthand, nearly everywhere on the planet, even toppling ostensibly brutal but sovereign regimes in its name. Yet terror, with a capital T, its tactics most often used by disciples fighting in the name of religion, has not been as it's not been effective in destroying American lives as the opioid medications prescribed without irony to kill their pain. Since 1995, terrorists of varied shape have killed 3,181 people in the U.S., nearly 3,000 of them in 9-11 alone, of course, which sparked the nation's unending war. That's a pretty startling figure indeed, particularly in a country known for Orwellian surveillance and tracking of visitors and citizens alike, but terror's death toll cannot be examined separately from known killers more easily stopped. In 2014, in the span of a single year, an astounding 29,467 Americans died by overdose of opioid-related drugs, including prescriptions. In the following year, 2015, saw more than 15,000 lose their lives to overdose on opioid medications, largely prescribed by so-called medical personnel. Opiates killed 10 times as many Americans in one year as all terror attacks in the last 20 years. Now, we've talked about how this affects my home state of West Virginia. I've spoken extensively and specifically about the number one state in America for overdoses on opiates. They're making some good moves. They've just passed medical marijuana. They've just passed industrial hemp. They even dumped their Obamacare exchange. Slowly but surely moving their way into the present. But that whole Appalachian area is a dark one. Let's head over to Erie, Pennsylvania for a look at opioid overdose deaths, and they continue to rise right now in this year, 2017. New numbers shine a new light on the drug abuse epidemic in Erie County. Good evening, Don is off tonight. County officials say the opiate epidemic is not slowing down and might even be getting worse. News Force Dave Graber talked to the county health commissioner today. Dave? Well, Jackie, on January 19th, the Erie County Executive, the District Attorney, and Health Commissioner all highlighted a spike in opioid overdose deaths early in 2017, a year that started off with one person dying every day in the first 19 days. 21 days later, and there are now 55 people who have died in the first First 40 days from opiate op overdoses, which shows the deadly epidemic so far is only getting worse this year. Now, as you can see in this graphic, the numbers have steadily been on the rise since 2012, with a massive spike from 2014 to 2015. The number of people dying is happening at such a rate there's a backlog at the medical examiner's office, leaving nearly 70 cases still pending from 2016. All of this is happening as the county's opioid task force is in full swing with a network of addiction centers a 24-hour hotline, and even some law enforcement agencies who were getting people help instead of just throwing them in jail. The biggest cause of this recent spike in deaths, according to County Health Commissioner Gail Burstein, is increasing use of fentanyl, which is cut with heroin and other opioids, and which is increasingly becoming more and more lethal. And even that substance is a moving target. Some of the batches, um, parts may have uh, mostly heroin, parts may have Heroin and fentanyl, parts may have mostly fentanyl. And when somebody buys a bag or a pouch or a white powder, I mean, there's no way to know what the true contents are. And just a few grains of fentanyl can kill you. It's, it's you know, f you know, 50 to 100 times um, more, you know, potent than, um, than heroin itself in some cases. So it's, it's very, very potent. Burstein says the health department also saw spikes like these early last year as well, so it could be a seasonal issue. But the task force will continue its work and even roll out additional programs to help curb addiction coming this spring. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. For Wednesday, May 3rd, 2017, I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Looking at the spikes 
as they call them, in opioid deaths and overdoses. And we're taking a delicious, nutritious look at what's really going on in the news. We try and give you news in a fear-free fashion. Doesn't mean it'll always be great news, but I'm not gonna hear. I'm not gonna be here yelling and telling you that the sky is falling. Based on a scathing front page expose in the Washington Post, presenting strong evidence that the largest organic milk producer in the United States has been operating illegally. The organic industry's most aggressive industry watchdog, the Cornucopia Institute, filed formal legal complaints against Aurora Dairy. Of course, our friend Lauren Coleman would always point out the massive sink uses of Aurora, which means Dawn. So that's the Dawn Dairy. Aurora Dairy and their organic certifier, the Colorado Department of Agriculture. The nonprofit simultaneously wrote to the Trump administration's new USDA secretary, Sonny Perdue, asking for the removal of the agency's lead organic regulator. This is not the first complaint Cornucopia has filed against Aurora more than a decade ago. Based on the organization's research, USDA investigators had found that Aurora was willfully violating 14 tenets of the organic law. Although career civil servants recommended Aurora be banned from organic commerce, Aurora's lawyers negotiated a favorable settlement that included a one-year probation and modifying practices at some of their livestock factories. The rigorous investigative work by Peter Horisky at the Washington Post clearly illustrates a pattern of long-term corruption by both Aurora Dairy and the USDA's National Organic Program. Our organic regulators have turned a blind eye as giant industrial operations place ethical, family-scale dairy farmers at a distinctive competitive disadvantage, said Mark A. Castle, Cornucopia's co-director. The flood of allegedly illegal organic milk has finally caught up to the aggressive growth in the organic marketplace. In the past few months, organic milk processors, processors have started cutting the price paid to farmers, placing some on quotas. Obviously, at a time of a surplus, the Washington Post article has the potential to damage the confidence of organic consumers paying a premium for milk and getting ripped off when they purchase products that are sourced from Aurora. Aurora Daily is the largest supplier of private label or store brand organic milk in the U.S., supplying such retail giants as Walmart, Costco, Target, and major supermarket change chains for their own proprietary brands. Now, this is an important thing to always know about. And again, I worked six long years in a grocery store chain here in Oregon. I worked for New Seasons Market. As they've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and taken all those millions from Endeavor Capital, you see stores start to roll out their own brand line. And you know enough about the store, you suddenly start seeing cartons of milk with the store logo, and it's like, I know we're not making that. That's how a lot of the food in this world works. It's made by some generic place, they ship it out to everywhere, and then they stamp their name on it. Oh yeah, these are our Debbie Cakes, we made them. Sorry. Little Debbie's a brand name. Oatmeal pies is what I meant to say. What Peter Horisky and his Washington Post colleagues found when they visited the largest Aurora Dairy complex in Weld County, Colorado, was a giant feedlot where almost all the 15,000 cows were confined to dirt and manure-covered pens rather than being out on pasture as the organic law requires. Though repeated visits over eight days, some up to ten hours long, and drone and satellite imagery... Reporters found no more than 10% of the cattle out on grass, and many times significantly less. When visiting in October prior to the first frost on the 20th, all cows were confined. Aurora claimed that their organic systems plan, all capitalized, approved by their certifier, the Colorado Department of Agriculture, ended their grazing on September 30th, even though the federal law clearly states that cows must have access to pasture during the entire grazing season. Cornucopia has long alleged that giant industrial dairies are systematically gaming the system, confining cattle in order to push cows for higher milk production, similar to standard operating practices on conventional concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs. These gross violations of the law were well documented in a series of complaints we filed against Aurora operations in Texas and other organic CAFOs in the U.S., as well as their certifiers that have languished at the USDA for over a year and a half without enforcement action. So this is a long article from Cornucopia, but it all goes back to this massive report from the Washington Post. Interesting times indeed. Their banner, of course, now says, democracy dies in darkness, and of course there are still people doing good work there. 
trying to keep the empire honest. So there is a lot of organic fakery going on, and it's been going on and going around for a while, just like anything you see that becomes wildly popular. As I've always said, the food world order is one of our most successful pushbacks against the powers that shouldn't be. I often make the joke, yeah, I stopped buying Boeing missiles, but damn it, if they just don't still make, keep making them. Now we stop buying their garbage food, and they are falling all over themselves to give us what we want. Yo, you want something different? We'll change. We'll, we'll, we'll sell you whatever you want. Just please keep giving us your money at massive giant grocery stores. Stocked with massive giant industrial farmed food. At best. So there are a lot of smaller companies, especially here in Oregon, who you know are making good products but can't afford the actual organic stamp. And there's a lot of propaganda that works both ways. So let's go to WLOS News 13 for the quote-unquote truth about organics. Eating organic has become a popular lifestyle not only here in the mountains but all across the country. Yeah, numbers from the Organic Trade Association show that 81% of American families are now buying organic food. But is everything marked organic at the grocery store what it really claims to be? Tonight in a special report, News 13's Megan Shearing talks with local farmers who share what it takes to grow truly organic. There are several organic farmers in Buncombe County. Some are certified by the USDA, others are not. All say they are following the strict set of standards set forth by the government. The demand for organic food is growing fast. What is this? That's because more and more people Everything here is seven. want to buy products that haven't been genetically altered or sprayed with chemicals. Many consumers rely on the organic label to tell them their food is safe. But some truly don't know how it's grown and the requirements farmers must follow to market their products organic. King Creek Valley Farm in Fletcher is one of many organic farms in the United States to earn special certification from the USDA. We started in 2006 and we've grown from two and a half acres to 55 acres. Co-owner Amanda Sizemore says the certification can cost thousands of dollars and it comes with a set of strict guidelines. There's no fungicides, herbicides, chemicals that are harmful used in production. Everything comes that we do spray is from a natural source. It includes submitting an annual organic system plan and inspections of the farm's fields and processing facilities. The USDA has their inspectors that come out twice a year. Samples are taken randomly at the warehouses when we ship. Um, they they're also taken randomly from the fields here. Soil management, record keeping, pest control methods, cleaning and storage are also checked. We go a step above and we pick in rubber surgical gloves. The USDA monitors everything closely. They get you financially if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing and then they take your certification and then your business is done. But the rules are different for those farmers not certified. There probably is in actuality very little difference between how the two of us carry out our farming philosophy. Ann Greer owns Gaining Ground Farm in Leicester. She, like Cane Creek Valley Farm, does not use chemical fertilizers, synthetic herbicides, or insecticides on her vegetables. But by law, she is prohibited from using the term organic to sell her products. We don't feel like we need to be certified because we're not large enough that we um, need to. There is no regulatory agency monitoring an uncertified organic farm's production. It is up to the consumers to establish a relationship with the grower to ensure their practices are being maintained. We have a personal relationship with every single person we're selling to. There's no middle person ever for any of our products. It's a little food for thought next time you go to buy organic. Now, what about those products labeled organic in the grocery store from other countries like Canada and Mexico? Well, the USDA also has organizations that certify and monitor their production, too. Back to you. Oh, thanks, lady. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Hump Day, Wednesday, May 3rd, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, coming to you, as always, from the Media Monarchy studios up here in the Pacific Northwest. We've been in peak Portland since the beginning of Media Monarchy. And we're glad you're with us whenever, wherever you are. Love it when you listen live. And take part in the chat, mediamonarchy.com slash listen. Or if you are listening later, in a garden, in a car, in a cube. We're glad you're here. The former deputy director of the Environmental Protection Agency who allegedly bragged that he deserved a medal 
for killing a study about the safety of Monsanto products is being taken to court over his refusal to answer simple questions about his current employment. Jess Rowland left the EPA in May 2016, soon after the apparently inadvertent release of an internal memorandum. Rowland was the chair of the committee that concluded that glyphosate, the active ingredient of Monsanto's flagship weed killer Roundup, was not carcinogenic to humans. The report was posted briefly online before being pulled. It was later cited in one of Monsanto's court cases. Monsanto is currently facing more than 50 lawsuits from farmers and clients diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma for allegedly causing the cancer through exposure to the company's flagship weed killer Roundup and for covering up the risks. The EPA is also being sued for delaying the release of the agency's Cancer Assessment Review Committee, CARC. That report and all documents relating to glyphosate. This follows a report from the World Health Organization labeling the active ingredient glyphosate as probable carcinogen in 2015. In the process, San Francisco Federal District Court Judge Vince Chabria ordered the communications between the EPA and Monsanto to be unsealed. Monsanto's production of documents suggests that Mr. Rowland went out of his way to benefit Monsanto's business, states the current brief against Rowland, which was filed last Friday. Quote, in the absence of scientific evidence to support its claim that Roundup does not cause non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Monsanto has relied overwhelmingly on the conclusions of the EPA, specifically a report engineered and authored by Jess Rowland, who is not a medical doctor, has no PhD, was not trained in nor worked in the fields of epidemiology or toxicology, and did not include any medical doctors in his review process and report on glyphosate. Last week, during a deposition with Jess Rowland over a possible cover-up between the EPA and Monsanto, Rowland, quote, refused to answer the simple question of whom he has been working for post-EPA departure, end quote, in May 2016, the brief states. Mr. Rowland's counsel corresponded with plaintiffs multiple times prior to the deposition, stating he's not consulting for Monsanto since his retirement and that he needn't be questioned on his consulting work any further, state a letter request from the plaintiffs to Judge Chabria. Claiming that the information was irrelevant to the case, Rowland refused to answer simple, relevant, and unprivileged questions, according to the letter. Subsequently, the Miller firm, one of the one of the representing law firms handling the litigation, requested a telephone hearing back on April 24th. Under the judge's order ruled on the same day, Rowland then almost immediately revealed three companies for whom he had been consulting since leaving the EPA. Despite his counsel having previously stated that his recent work has been unrelated to the chemical industry... Roland admitted that his consulting work concerned chemicals. Now, and we're not going to find out who they are, eh? You can get that article from whowhatwhy.org as you are listening to the Food World Order edition of your Morning Monarchy. As the crimes and corruptions and the lies and the cover-ups don't just happen in the banks. That seems like the big, sexy, Martin Scorsese, Wolf of Wall Street kind of world. But maybe the not as fun, not quite as sexy... Maybe a little bit more like The Informant, Steven Soderbergh's comedy film about price fixing at Archer Daniels Midland starring Matt Damon. Pretty interesting film. I love Steven Soderbergh. He cranks out like three, four movies a year. So there are these cases. There are these salacious criminal cases that revolve around food. Where are the screenwriters making these films? When your clients are all sitting in federal prisons around the country and you're down to your last written arguments in the appellate courts, it's not time to hold back. That's roughly where the nation's most important food safety case finds itself on the day after attorneys for the three Peanut Corporation of America criminal defendants began filing their reply briefs in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit in Atlanta. Nothing is held back as three former executives appeal prison sentences related to the 2008-2009 salmonella outbreak that was traced to peanut butter and paste produced by the Peanut Corporation of America. Thousands were sickened and nine people died. Take the way defense attorney Thomas Ledford put his client Mary Wilkerson on the record favoring oral arguments, which the government and defense attorneys for brothers Stuart Parnell and Michael Parnell have all said they favor. In his one-page statement favoring oral arguments, Ledford said a live session is needed because of Brady abuses of discovery. The prosecution's mega-data dump of millions of pages on the defense, potential prosecutorial misconduct, and violations of various constitutional and due process rights. 
Wilkerson is 43, was the quality control officer for the now defunct Peanut Corporation of America in Blakely, Georgia. Who was the governor in Georgia? <clears throat> she was convicted by a jury trial in September 2014 on one count of obstruction of justice and sentenced a year later to five years in federal prison. The jury found her not guilty on a second count of obstruction. Like former PCA Chief Executive Stuart Parnell and his peanut broker brother Michael Parnell, Wilkerson wants to reverse both her conviction and sentence with the appeal. One of the issues she wants the appellate justices to examine is whether the prosecution presented sufficient evidence for the jury to have found her guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So what this gets to is 25 of Stuart Parnell's 28-year prison sentence might not stand. From a one corporate to consumer related scandal to another, Stuart Parnell, he is the top ranking exec of the Peanut Corporation of America. He was sentenced yesterday to 28 years behind bars. It is the toughest penalty ever for a corporate executive in a food poisoning outbreak. He is 61 years old. Unless he wins an appeal, he will die in prison. Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, is with me now. Judge, it is great to see you. Oh, likewise. So it seems as if Stuart Parnell is going to die in prison for all intents and purposes, but he admitted it, right? He got this news of Salmonella being in the peanuts and said, just ship it. I can't afford to lose another customer. Well, that that's actually what, what caused him to be convicted here is a combination of emails and the testimony of others involved in what the government called was a grand criminal conspiracy the end result of which was sickening 20,000 people and killing nine people. No, I it's mean, crazy. When, when you look at it that way, and I don't believe in very heavy sentences, but when you look at it that way, 28 years, he was exposed to 800 years if you, if you, if you separated each of the injuries mm -hmm. and each of the deaths. You put an adulterated product in the stream of commerce that is capable of maiming and killing, and you do so knowingly, and you order people to do it, and you do it with other people. Uh, you, you have to expect this kind of a consequence. I mean, he did say, I'm sorry, but I'm sure for those nine families that lost members, they don't really care that he's Well, here, here's the interesting thing. The, there have been no civil lawsuits yet because the rule of thumb is you wait until the criminal case is over. And the criminal case is over now. A criminal case ends at the time of sentencing. He can file his appeal, but his appeal is not going to affect the civil case. Here's what's going to happen in the civil case. The insurance carriers, there's more than one, are going to say, we insure for negligence. Mm. This was not negligence. This, this was, was done an with purpose. Right. Yeah. This was an intentional criminal act. Don't look to us. Look to the assets of the corporation, which probably would put it out of business if all 22,000 people plus the estates of the nine who died sue. So, Judge, have you ever seen anything like this? I remember there was the Tylenol case back in the late 80s, but there's well, nothing uh, where... Tylenol was an interloper. It wasn't the, it wasn't right, the corporation. It wasn't they, they may have had faulty caps, but it wasn't intentional. No, I have never seen one uh, like this. And my first reaction was, oh, this is some judge, some Justice Department that hates business. I never heard of a 28-year prison sentence for a white-collar crime. But th this is uh, one of the worst examples I've ever seen. Now, in, in fairness to him, he does have appealable issues. The judge did do some bizarre things in this case, like meet with the jury alone to explain to them what the evidence meant without the government there and without defense Which counsel is highly there. unusual. Not only is it unusual, it could be reversible error. I don't want to give him a, a cause for false hope, but most times when judges do that, believe it or not, they do it, they end up getting reversed. But an appellate court will look at the quanta, quantum of evidence and say, even if we take out the judge's meeting, is there enough to convict? In my opinion, yes. Yeah, especially as you rightly point out, those emails are pretty damn it. They, this kind of just skip it, can't afford to lose another customer. Oh, That's at one point clear. he said roast the peanuts a little bit longer, as, as if cooking them for a little bit longer would kill the salmonella. There's, there's no scientific support for that. No one even knows where he came up with that uh, theory. His, his cavalier attitude about human life is shocking disturbing. in the case of someone in the food industry who puts food into the stream of commerce. Yeah, Judge, it's great to see you. Thank you for your Next time we'll talk about Something... Volkswagen's okay. potential criminal liability. I would like that. We need your insight on that because 18 billion is a pretty big number. Where did you get this? The alternative media, Jerry. That's where you hear the truth. 
You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. You are listening to the Food World Order edition of your Morning Monarchy for Hump Day, Wednesday, May 3rd, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Glad you're here. Diet soda getting more bad publicity. PepsiCo said this week that its latest quarter was boosted by guilt-free products such as diet soda and bottled water as consumers move away from sugary drinks. But more research is casting a pall over artificially sweetened beverages, too. This coming from Market Watch. I think it would also note that Pepsi is getting amazing publicity. I don't know if Lauren Coleman's going to do copycat effect on, on this. The amount of synchronistic ways that Pepsi is working its way into the news is an interesting one. And, of course, they're no brand new thing. They're not only the choice of a generation, but, of course, they're also connected to death squads in Nicaragua and all those fun things back in the decades. Artificially sweetened beverages may be linked to an increased risk of stroke and dementia, according to a recent study by the American Heart Association's peer-reviewed journal, Stroke. The researchers looked at 2,888 people over the age of 45 for stroke risks and 1,484 people over the age of 60 for risk of dementia. After adjustments were made for age, sex, education, caloric intake, diet, exercise, and smoking, they found that diet soda drinks were associated with increased risk of ischemic stroke, all-cause dementia, and Alzheimer's disease dementia. The study cites correlation rather than causation. Diet soda sales have tumbled as consumers, turned off by studies on artificial sweeteners, have switched to bottled water, teas, and energy drinks instead, all owned by those same corporations, all pressed out in horrible plastic bottles and garbage. That's just the sidebar to the, you know, dementia and Alzheimer's. As this is not the first study that's made a connection between diet soda to other serious medical issues... Several recent studies have linked diet soda and cardiovascular disease and showed a correlation, if not causation, between cancer and aspartame. The beverage industry says people who are overweight and already at risk for heart disease may consume more diet drinks in an attempt to control their weight, and the Food and Drug Administration has ruled that artificial sweeteners are safe. And that's the extra trick. See this people in the grocery store. Big, giant, fat guys in just a grocery cart full of diet soda. Dude, that's obviously not working. Advertising aside. Now, I don't know if you have Albertsons where you are, and of course, grocery stores and lots of corporations. They own different things, but they keep the branding separate. This is something I noticed when I had moved here and started working in the grocery store. I'm like, best foods, mayonnaise. This logo looks exactly like Hellman's. And I go look it up. Oh, because they own it. They just keep the separate identities on the separate coasts. It's Best Foods on the West Coast. It's Hellman's on the East. Oh, it's Carl's Jr. on the West Coast. It's fucking Hardee's on the East Coast. It's the same company. And unfortunately, they're right in knowing that lots of people are too dumb to figure out what's going on. Just five years ago, Albertsons had fewer than 200 stores and $4 billion in sales. Today, the company has 2,300 stores and rings up $60 billion in annual sales. This eye-popping growth comes courtesy of an aggressive acquisition agenda by Albertsons and their owner, Cerberus Capital Management. You think I was joking about Endeavor Capital. That's who pretty much essentially 49% owns the last two corporate places I ever worked for in Portland. Alpha, the radio station, and New Seasons. They got millions from investor capital. That's why they are growing at an alarming rate and abandoning the things they used to say were part of their mission statement. Editorial sidebar. The chain has snapped up United Supermarkets, Tom Thumb, and more than two dozen stores belonging to Hagen. Two years ago, its acquisition of Safeway, I bet you know that one, made it the second largest traditional grocery store company behind Kroger. By acquiring Whole Foods, Albertsons may finally be able to push through an IPO it has long sought, which would allow it to raise money and pay down some of its considerable debt. That debt load likely would swell further with an acquisition of Whole Foods. The company is ambitious, but it also happens to be an effective manager. As part of their 2006 acquisition of Albertsons, SuperValue and Cerberus divided up the company's stores. Whereas SuperValue struggled to turn around its locations, Cerberus saw its store count improved. Eventually, SuperValue sold 900 of its 1,100 stores to Cerberus. Is Albertsons going to buy Whole Foods? Holy moly. 
Now, another question coming from one we always look at with a cocked eye, if you will. And these are the kind of sites that, again, as we've been trying to share this information with our friends and family for the last 15 years, it gets to the point where you're like, I can't really share any InfoWars links. And that happened a decade ago. And also, natural news. Like, ah, I'm not going to change anybody's minds by sending them this. They're just going to jump all over me, and now they have a name they can call it. Fake news. But natural news asks the question, Will setting up shop in Target be what saves Whole Foods from its dramatic decline? One analyst from Bernstein, a prominent investment firm, certainly seems to think so. The recommendation to abandon the opening of standalone stores and transition to satellite markets within Target comes on the heels of Whole Foods' worst sales slump in more than a decade. So will Whole Foods plan to place satellite markets inside Target stores? That'd be a great way to kick Walmart's butt, wouldn't it? Let's try and get a little bit of good news, if we can, as we start to wrap up this Food World Order edition of Your Morning Monarchy. Autism could now be added to the lengthy and perpetually expanding list of afflictions and symptoms. You're wondering how this is good news. Treatable with the one product of nature shamefully prohibited by the feds, the miracle palliative cannabis. One in nearly every 68 kids in the U.S. is now affected by autism, and the number of kids coping with the developmental disorder has been increasing at an explosively alarming rate in recent years, probably due to lots of the stories that we've talked about over the last 41 minutes. Fresh evidence again frowns upon U.S. federal prohibition of cannabis, listing it as Schedule 1. In contrast to its staunch U.S. ally, Israel has approached the cannabis plant as the medicinal healer it has more than proven to be. As USA Today notes in a recent article titled, Marijuana May Be a Miracle Treatment for Children with Autism, Israel and just two other countries, Canada and the Netherlands, perhaps unsurprisingly, have government-sponsored medical marijuana programs available to its citizens. And the article from USA Today, which of course we'll link to, talks about a little kid named Noah. (laughs) There's no H at the end of it, but the biblical implications, of course, are there. Noah is part of the first clinical trial in the world to test the benefits of medicinal marijuana for young people with autism. That's good news. You know what else is good news? Researchers at the University of Texas at San Antonio have launched a free Spanish version of a program to help people quit smoking. The move was made after the English version showed success. The program called Quittex turns the user's phone into a personal quit smoking coach. Quit text will send text messages, helps handling stress, and can help set a quick date. I would have loved to have had that. I'm coming up on my fifth anniversary of quitting cigarettes cold turkey, July 15th. And I remember at the time I still worked at the grocery store, which had a great health plan and had the nurse line. You could call it up, doot doot and they'd help you. God, I called that nurse line to basically say, well, you know, I kind of feel existential dread, like I'm mourning the loss of a friend since I quit. She didn't know what to do. They don't know how to deal with that. They're more likely to be able to deal with me calling them, oh, my stomach hurts or my tooth hurts or it hurts when I go like this. They'll say, don't go like that. I'd love to help you quit smoking if you're out there trying to quit smoking cigarettes. I smoked for 17 years. It's no small thing. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, and I still battle with some of it. We talk about making the changes to make ourselves more healthy. Quitting smoking cigarettes is a huge one. I feel like I can look outside, and Cassie's definitely pointed this out since the 2008 econo crash. More and more people are smoking. It's cheaper. It's an appetite suppressant. It helps keep you social. But if we're going to make these choices and make better decisions, that's a huge one. So I can be your quit smoking buddy. You can always reach out to me, james at mediamonarchy.com. Last couple of stories, the radiohead ant. A new species of silky ant grows fungus gardens for food. The ants of the genus Syracomyrmex, literally translated as silky ants. They've made a new discovery. One of those species... Sirico Miramax Radiohead Eye, collected in the Venezuelan Amazon, was named after the famous British music band Radiohead. We wanted to honor their music, one of the authors, Anna Jeselvnik, says. But more importantly, we wanted to acknowledge the conservation efforts of the band members, especially in raising climate change awareness. We'll see if they'll 
follow through on that show in Israel. Our last couple of Food World Order notes take us to the dark of night, as that helps transition us to our Thursday episodes of Holy Hexes. Clouds of white smoke rise into the black sky from outdoor grills. The night air is scented with the fragrances of dozens of cuisines from around the world. Vendors in tiny stalls stir noodles, toss crepes, and fill dumplings as lines of hungry customers stretch into the dark. That was the scene at the Queen's Night Market as it opened for the season in New York City. It's one of a number of sprawling nighttime food markets inspired by the massive night markets of Asia that have started popping up around the U.S. There are also regular night markets in Philadelphia and Southern California and occasional night markets held elsewhere. This is part of the food revolution. This is part of the real community revolution. Pepsi and McDonald's and the USDA don't have shit to do with this. This is people in your town, in your home, in your area that you know making food for each other. I know it sounds like a hippie Shangri-La. And it, and it is. Our last note of food darkness. <laughs> Goth ice cream, of course. There's a store in downtown LA called Little Damage that makes black ice cream. And it even looks like their cones are black. So you have black ice cream... On the, on the outside, because black ice cream is how you feel on the inside. The menu has <laughs> names like Black Roses and, of course, special bonus points for Unicorn Tears. That's how we wrap up your Food World Order menu, my friends. All those headlines put together in advance for you, so if you listen to the show live, you can hit all those up on the Twitter moment. And, of course, once the show gets posted, about an hour after we're off the air, everything we say and play will be included in the show notes. We're going to go out with brand new music from The Drums. They are teasing their forthcoming record, Abysmal Thoughts, and we are big drums fans, and we're excited to share a brand new song from them as your song of the day today. But first, let's take that always important stroll down this day in history, my friends. May 3rd, 1715. A total solar eclipse was visible across northern Europe and northern Asia, as predicted by Edmund Haley, to within four minutes of accuracy. May 3rd, 1802. The District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., the city-state on par with the City of London and Vatican City, was incorporated as a city on this day, May 3rd, 1802. May 3rd, 1921, West Virginia becomes the first state to legislate a broad sales tax, but doesn't implement it until a number of years later due to enforcement issues. May 3rd, 1937, Gone with the Wind, novel by Margaret Mitchell, wins the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. And on this day, May 3rd, 1962 events... The Anne Frank House Museum opens in Amsterdam, and the Fantastics opened. The show became the longest-running musical in theater history. May 3, 1963, the police force in Birmingham, Alabama, switches tactics and responds with violent force to stop the Birmingham campaign protesters. Images of the violent suppression are transmitted worldwide, bringing newfound attention to the civil rights movement. May 3rd, 1967, Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys went to court today on draft evasion charges. May 3rd, 1973, the 108-story Sears Tower in Chicago is topped out at 1,451 feet as the world's tallest building, now of course owned by Larry Silverstein and called the Willis Tower. May 3rd, 1978, the first unsolicited bulk commercial email, which would later become known as Spam was sent by the Digital Equipment Corporation marketing representative to every ARPANET address on the west coast of the United States. May 3rd, 1986, Dollywood opens in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. I've been there. I was even there when it was called Silver Dollar City before it was Dollywood. May 3rd, 1988, Queensryche released their album Operation Mind Crime. And that same day, Poison released their album Open Up and Say Ah. May 3rd, 2000, the sport of geocaching begins with the first cache placed and the coordinates from a GPS posted on Usenet. And it is the 10th anniversary and you're seeing the headlines everywhere. May 3rd, 2007, less than two weeks before her fourth birthday, Madeline McCann of Rothley, England, vanishes during a family vacation at a resort in southern Portugal. McCann's disappearance prompted an international search. However, she has never been found. The apartment block remains sealed off. Jerry and Kate McCann and their two younger children have been moved to another part of the resort. Police dogs were brought in late yesterday and have again been trying to pick up a trail. Last night, the family emerged to make a brief appeal for help from the public. Mrs. McCann clutched a child's toy while her husband spoke. Words cannot describe 
the anguish and despair that we are feeling as the parents of our beautiful daughter Madeline. We request that anyone who may have any information related to Madeline's disappearance, no matter how trivial, contact the Portuguese police and help us get her back safely. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy, brother and sister. The decision to leave the children alone while they ate at a nearby restaurant must haunt them, but they felt they were doing everything a parent should. The door of the apartment can be seen from the place where they were eating. They returned regularly to check the children were still asleep. But on the opposite side of the apartment is a shuttered window. When Kate McCann returned on one of her regular checks, it had been slid open and Madeline was gone. She celebrates her fourth birthday later this week. Her parents are now desperately hoping she'll be home well before that. She's a lovely wee girl, a normal, healthy wee child, full of life. She just learned to swim without her water wings. She started her first tennis lessons. She's a wee dancer. She likes everything. She loves her wee brother and her wee sister. She kills them with kindness, kissing them and helping them out and doing things. Locals and holidaymakers have joined the police in search in the area. Maps and photos of the missing girl have been handed out. The Algarve is hugely popular with British tourists. Crime is low, so the police here have limited resources, but many people have volunteered to help. The police are checking out one possible site in about eight hours after Madeline disappeared. Just before dawn, a motorist said that his car headlights picked out a couple on the road. They had a child with them, and according to him, it looked as if they were trying to avoid being seen. Madeline's grandparents have also flown in from England to lend support and defended the decision to leave the children alone in the apartment. Her grandmother said Jerry and Kate were good parents who'd been watching the apartment from their table in the restaurant. The family have been critical of the efforts of the Portuguese authorities, but the British ambassador here says everything possible is being done. I have been in touch with the national chief of police during the course of the day and also with the chief of police here in the Algarve, and they have assured me that everything possible is being done. There is an intensive and extensive uh, search and investigation underway and that will continue during the night. At the moment this is still a missing person inquiry rather than an abduction but it now seems highly unlikely that the little girl wandered out of the apartment alone. In Woods Sky News, Praia de Lutz in the Portuguese Algarve. And that's from May 5th, 2007, as we are looking at the 10th anniversary of the disappearance of Madeleine McCann this day in history. On 2015, May 3rd, two gunmen launched an attempted attack on an anti-Islam event in Garland, Texas, which was held in response to the Charlie Hebdo shooting. I didn't post anything to Media Monarchy 10 years ago today. Nothing. Had lots of May 2nds and lots of May 4ths, but nothing for May 3rd. I'll still remind you, Media Monarchy's been online since 9-11-05, and there are 11,000-plus articles, interviews, episodes, videos. Celebrating birthdays today on May 3rd, quite the batch. Crazed bastards like Nikolai Machiavelli and Golda Meir born on this day. It's also Bing Crosby's birthday, a nice Seattle boy. Mary Astor born on this day, Pete Seeger, Sugar Ray Robinson, and the late, great Robert Osborne born on this day. I was talking when we met up with friends the other night out at a bar. The bar, what did they have on? Turner Classic Movies. It's also the amazing James Brown, Frankie Valli, Ron Popeil, all born today. And one of the lesser Gumbles, Greg Gumble, born on this day. It's also Doug Henning's birthday and Ron Wyden. That's right, Oregon Senator, one of the best Congress critters. Still far from perfect. Sailing from Christopher Cross. It's also Pastor Chuck Baldwin's birthday. Ben Elton. I have his book Stark sent to me by a listener. Christina Hendricks from Madman and Paul Banks from Interpol all celebrating birthdays today. We might play some, you know, Christopher Cross up in the pump up the volume. Probably not, though. That's your morning monarchy. We do pump up the volume and it's all brought to you by you, my friends. Going out with brand new music from the drums as we wrap up your morning monarchy for Wednesday, May 3rd, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more from MediaMonarchy.com. Thanking you very much for listening, my friends, and hope you'll tell a friend about us. And continue to support our work at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. And now I'm reminding you, as always, like Jello Biafra says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. <laughs> 
You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.